Hi, Andrew. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here is here, and thanks to everybody else um, for coming along. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Erica. Erica's been here now for three or four years. Um, she came up from Sydney University, where she'd been working with Maria Byrne. Um, Maria felt that she was um, didn't have many coral people to, to, to work with down in Sydney, and, and so Erica came up here. Uh, where we do a lot more of the sort of work that Erica wanted to look at. And in particular, Erica was interested in, in larval ecology. And um, so over the last few years, she's been looking at the effects of temperature on larval ecology and also looking at how some um, larval traits might influence biogeographic patterns. And I'll hand over to Erica. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> so my thesis title is Coral Larval Ecology and Biogeography in a Warming Ocean. And I've been working on my PhD under the supervision of Andrew Baird, Sally Keith, and Maria Byrne, with some extra <coughs> and support. So changing temperatures are affecting distribution of species worldwide. And rising temperatures in particular are affecting plants and animals across systems. These impacts vary by location. And the biological responses uh, to temperature are strongly influenced by the thermal tolerance breadth of the organism, which in turn are influenced by the environment. And to illustrate this on a smaller scale, I'll talk about these beautiful porcelain crabs. And Jonathan Stillman found that crabs from the more variable intertidal environments have a broader breadth of tolerance, a thermal tolerance, than corals that come from stable subtidal areas. And this principle can be applied to a larger scale. Temperatures are highest and most stable around the equator. And um, as you move towards higher latitudes, um, the regions experience greater ranges of uh, temperatures throughout the year. And this influences distribution of life on Earth, particularly in ectotherms, like crabs and corals and lizards which are essentially cold-blooded animals that can't control their internal temperatures, at least not physiologically. So life in the tropics is pretty sweet if you're an ectotherm because things are stable. But one of the trade-offs for this tropical lifestyle is a tropical tolerance. And what I mean by that is the thermal tolerance breadths are narrower. So this image is from Tewksbury, and the y-axis shows the relative Darwinian fitness of um, species of lizards in the tropics and also at high latitudes. So the ability to grow, survive, and reproduce. And the x-axis shows temperature. So the lines represent the um, <coughs> uh, fitness curves of the lizards according to temperature. And they're narrower in the tropics compared to higher latitudes. Now, these match current temperature ranges shown in the gray line. However, projected ranges by the end of the century exceed the fitness of the lizards in the tropics, whereas they sit within the fitness of lizards at higher latitudes. And I also want to point out that this has been observed in um, the same species at different populations. So because of this, the greatest impact of rising temperatures by the end of the century is expected to be around the equator and in the tropics. And most work has been done on terrestrial ectotherms, and there's an increasing amount of information um, being collected in marine realms. And this figure really illustrates why it's important to look at the effect of riding, rising temperatures across space. And it's important to look at uh, the effects of rising temperatures um, on the Great Barrier Reef because sea surface temperatures are rising. And we've seen that um, thresholds vary by location um, and are consistent with local temperatures. For instance, um, the temperature thresholds are lower in the southern Great Barrier Reef because temperatures are generally lower there. Um, and I want to point out this is a general um, bleaching threshold. Uh, there's also variation among species within locations. So on a smaller scale, um, Oliver and Plumby looked at different populations of adult corals in different locations within one reef system in American Samoa and found that the 
coral colonies that came from uh, areas with greater temperature fluctuation had greater um, tolerance to heat stress. Now, my work focuses on a different part of the coral life cycle. Most work has been focused on adults. However, these benthic invertebrates rely on their dispersive stage in order to um, colonize and interbreed. So it's crucial for replenishment of populations and also recovery of reef systems following disturbances like bleaching events or cyclones. <clears throat> In addition, it's a useful way to measure thermal tolerance of coral because I work with species that don't have symbionts, so the thermal response can be attributed to the coral host. And more specifically, I do my experiments on broadcast spawners because they fertilize externally outside of the parent colony, so I can watch the gamenogenesis, so the development from the fertilized egg to the um, free-swimming planula larvae the larva, and um, because this, these stages are in contact with the water, those, that's when water temperatures are really going to affect them. So not that much work has been done on the effects of raised temperatures on coral larvae. However, um, a few studies have observed that raised temperatures increase the rates of abnormal development. So here we have um, irregular cell splitting and ab abnormal cleavage, and it also raised temperatures also decrease survivorship. And these are two good indicators for larval health and are what I use to measure um, and, and look at larval to uh, thermal tolerance in coral larvae. Um, in addition, uh, an effect of raised temperatures is increasing rates of development. So my general thesis aims are to look at the effects of temperature on larval ecology, to look at how these effects vary through space, and then look at how larval ecology influences patterns, larger patterns of biogeography, of uh, distribution and abundance. So my specific questions are for chapter one, um, look at the effects of raised and lower temperatures on coral larvae. Um, answer the question of whether self-fertilized coral embryos have the same fitness as cross-fertilized embryos, and then look at how thermal tolerance breaths vary across areas in eastern Australia. And the fourth chapter investigates the effects of larval ecology on biogeography, and the specific question is, can, lar can life history traits predict differences in assemblage structure across a dispersal barrier? So for question one, how do raised and lower temperatures affect development and survival of coral embryos in the Southern Great Barrier Reef? And are colder waters a dispersal, a barrier to dispersal of tropical corals to higher latitudes? And I want to point out that no one ever looks at the effect of lower temperature. I know I've just talked about climate change and rising temperatures, but I also want to understand breadth of tolerance, not just upper limits. And um, because the East Australian current can carry larvae um, southward, temperatures that a larva might experience during long distance dispersal are likely to be lower temperatures. So for this chapter, I'm looking at the effects of temperature at One Tree Island, and uh, this island sits on the Capricorn, uh, on the Tropic of Capricorn, so is at the southern limit of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and also the southern limit of the tropics. So following um, the spawning events and the fertilization, I raised embryos at treatments across an <coughs> eight degree range surrounding a local ambient. And in this case, I measured um, the development stage at multiple time points so that I could calculate development rates. And I also looked at survival, how many embryos were remaining at each time point. And I did this um, because I'm interested in the very early stages, I did this for from two hours to 144 hours following fertilization. So I followed them for about a week. So for about that time, I was either counting or napping. <laughs> <laughs> so this shows the median larval lifespans um, calculated from Kaplan-Meier survivorship analysis. 
and it's in hours. <clears throat> and the x-axis shows uh, the temperature treatments. And for the purposes of um, this presentation, or at, during this presentation, I'm presenting threshold as the point at which we see an effect of temperature. So in Goniastriophabolus on the left, the threshold was somewhere between two and four degrees above ambient. Whereas in Acropora spathulata, the threshold was above ambient, somewhere between ambient and two degrees above ambient. <clears throat> and um, we see that Goniastriophabolus may have a wider breadth of tolerance. Um, in addition, there was a relationship between development rate and temperature. Um, on the y-axis, we have development rate calculated from the time to the gastrula stage. Oh, and I forgot to mention in the previous figure that the bars represent 95% um, confidence intervals, so I, I determined significance on whether or not they overlapped. Um, for this, I ran an ANOVA, and the letters represent two piece groups, Fergoniastria fabulous and Acropora spathulata. And Goniastria fabulous developed at a greater rate than Acropora spathulata, and we're pretty sure we can attribute this to the fact that Goniastria fabulous has smaller eggs. So for chapter one, we can say that temperature does influence the rate of larval development, raised temperatures reduce survival, although the effects varied among species, and a novel finding of this chapter is that reduced temperatures did not affect survival, at least down to four degrees below ambient. So this may mean that colder waters aren't a dispersal barrier to higher latitude reefs. So for chapter two, um, I look at a particular strategy in this species, uh, Goniastri fabulous. And when you're a benthic marine invertebrate, you can't go around mating. So you really depend on your dispersive larval stage and sending out egg and sperm in order to reproduce. So corals go to great lengths to ensure successful fertilization. One example is the mass spawning on the Great Barrier Reef, where they all spawn at the same time so that it increases the chances of fertilization. And another strategy is self-fertilization. So this is thought to be a strategy for um, low density, is that there's no one else to breed with, you can just breed with yourself if you're a hermaphrodite. And this is quite rare in corals, but it's um, this species can self-fertilize. And so um, the question for this chapter was whether or not that ability comes at a cost. So do self-fertilized larvae have the same fitness as cross-fertilized larvae? And again, on the y-axis, we have median larval lifespan, um, and the bars represent 95% uh, confidence intervals. And we see that um, self-fertilized embryos lifespan were significantly lower than cross-fertilized uh, life embryos um, across from ambient at minus two and at plus uh, two, at plus four, they're both quite low. An interesting result is that um, they didn't seem to be affected by lower temperatures. So maybe this strategy can work in colder waters at higher latitudes. But although it's better to breed with yourself than no one at all, um, it's probably not a great long-term strategy because it produces less healthy embryos. <laughs> so now chapter three looks at how these effects of temperature vary across space. And the specific question is, do early life stages of corals from higher latitudes have a greater thermal tolerance breaths? So, I ran experiments at Lizard Island in the Northern Great Barrier Reef, and one tree island in the Southern Great Barrier Reef, and Lord Howe Island, which is the world's southernmost coral reef and sits about 1,000 kilometers south of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And I also want to make sure to emphasize that as you increase in latitude, the uh, range of temperatures experienced at that location is greater. So I was able to collect data for the following species at each location. 
the strongest comparison will be between lizard and one tree islands because I was able to collect the same species at both of those locations. So here I am counting again, and this time I'm looking at the uh, lethal as well as sublethal effects of temperature. So I'm also looking at the um, proportion of abnormal embryos at different temperature treatments, and I'm looking at survival again. So this shows um, the larval lifespan, the medium lifespan in hours of Acroporus baculata, so the same species in the northern Great Barrier Reef at Lizard Island and in the southern Great Barrier Reef at One Tree Island. And we see that the, um, the threshold doesn't change. There is an effective temperature between ambient and two degrees at both locations. Now for Goniastri phallus, on the other hand, the threshold appears to be between ambient and two degrees um, in the northern Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> but between two and four degrees in the southern Great Barrier Reef, so this could be evidence for a greater breadth of tolerance at higher latitudes. Now, for proportion abnormal embryos, um, this, uh, for this I ran um, ANOVAs, and the letters represent two key groups. Uh, the threshold for normal development, so the temperature at which um, the proportion of abnormal embryos was significantly increased is somewhere between ambient and two degrees above ambient. And in the Southern Great Barrier Reef, it's higher, um, between two and four. For Goniastria fabulous, in the Northern Great Barrier Reef, the threshold was between ambient and two degrees. And in the Southern Great Barrier Reef at One Tree Island, there was no effect of temperature on um, abnormal developments or uh, rates of abnormal proportion of normal embryos, and also it was quite low. And I'll just show you um, our findings from Lord Howe Island, where we collected data for Goniastria australensis and Cyphastria microthalma. Uh, first thing you'll notice is that the lifespans were very low. Um, the median lifespan wasn't more than a couple of days, and there was no effective temperature. Now this could be owed to maybe we collected um, unhealthy embryos or as a bad uh, unhealthy gametes or as a bad spawning year, but then again this is consistent with observations of low recruitment rates at Lord Howe Island. Interestingly, we did get an effect of temperature on proportion abnormal embryos, where um, temperature somewhere between two and four degrees uh, it was a threshold that significantly increased rates of abnormal development. So what do the thresholds identified in this study mean in the context of local temperatures? To answer that in the same way that Tewksbury did, um, I created these schematics that are based on data from the study. And this shows the survival, the median lifespan of Goniastri fabulous at, in the Northern Great Barrier Reef and the Southern Great Barrier Reef. I also have, in presenting, the um, absolute temperatures, but I'm also identifying ambient, which, change, which was different between locations. And the dotted red line shows the thresholds identified in my experiments. And I'll point out again that at Lizard Island, there appears to be a, a four degree thermal tolerance breadth around ambient uh, across the eight degree test range. And at One Tree Island, it's a little bit wider. Um, however, I wasn't able to identify the true lower thermal limit. So this is at least commenting on the breadth of tolerance surrounding a local ambient. So the gray line represents the current range of temperatures. And in the northern Great Barrier Reef, this exceeds the identified threshold. And projected temperatures by the end of the century um, the mean temperature in particular exceeds the fitness of the embryos at Lizard Island, but, and the range exceeds it at One Tree Island, but the mean is still within the fitness. And these schematics um, I've applied to the rates of normal development, so the proportion of embryos that weren't developing abnormally, and 
in the northern Great Barrier and Pergoniastria species. Um, at Lord Howe Island, we weren't able to collect the same species, but it's still uh, in the Goniastria genus. And yeah, uh, at one tree island, we weren't able to find enough, uh, a, thre a true upper threshold or lower threshold. But if you look at the difference between Lizard Island and Lord Howe Island, you can see that you know, in the absence of adaptation, um, the lower latitude populations are at greater risk. So there are still a lot of questions, um, but the results are consistent with the hypothesis that greater tolerance breadth um, occur at higher latitudes. And again, in the absence of adaptation, rising sea surface temperatures are likely to have a greater negative impact on early life stages of corals from lower latitude regions. So now for my fourth and final chapter, I am thinking more broadly. And the first three chapters looked at larval ecology and the effects of temperature on, on larval ecology. And now I'm interested in how larval ecology and traits throughout the whole coral life cycle can influence large scale biogeography. So, so life history traits characterize growth, reproduction, and survival in plants and animals. And they influence spatial patterns and ecological success in marine and terrestrial <laughs> organisms. And they're also linked to survival in changing environments and at the edge, edges of geographical distributions. Uh, life history traits related to dispersal in particular um, have been associated with the ability to persist in marginal conditions and through changing environments. For instance, in echinoderms, um, geological records and multiple observations um, suggest that species with larvae that aren't feeding and also have short planktonic uh, larval durations are better at surviving through mass extinctions and also through anthropogenic disturbances. Now, in corals, the effects of life history traits on distribution and persistence remains unclear. Um, one interesting suggestion is that um, brooders might be better at surviving changing conditions, and um, that's based on geological records in the Caribbean and fewer brooders went extinct during the Oligocene Miocene extinction. <coughs> and Keith et al. found that certain life history traits are able to predict the ability of a species to cross a faunal break or to cross a barrier. <clears throat> and my question to add to this is, does, does this apply to smaller scales? Can life history traits predict the ability to cross breaks, but also to become abundant once it crosses a break? So I'm not just using presence absence data. I'm looking at um, coral percent cover and abundance to see if it can become abundant once it crosses. And my area of interest was Lord Howe Island. And it has a very low species richness. It's considered a marginal environment because it sits at the southern limit of um, coral distribution. And um, it also experiences cold temperatures and a wide range of temperatures. And it's a known dispersal barrier to coral larva, and that's been um, confirmed with uh, genetic studies as well as um, models of larval dispersal. And another um, interesting observation of Lord Howe Island, even though we don't know that much about Lord Howe Island, is that brooding species are quite dominant on that reef. And just to tell you more about brooding species, brooders release fully formed planula larvae that are immediately competent to settle and grow. They fertilize internally. Um, spawners send out egg and sperm into the water column for external fertilization, and it takes a few days to develop um, into a, a larva that's competent, competent to settle. And that sperm is not to scale. <laughs> um, so brooders settle on release. Spawners have an obligate planktonic period. And so this might mean that brooders are better colonizers because they have, uh, as Joanna found, they have greater rates of local recruitment compared to uh, spawners. <clears throat> 
So my question for chapter four is, are species traits across the whole coral life cycle related to biology, morphology, and environmental tolerance predictors for changes in assemblage structure across this dispersal barrier between the Great Barrier Reef and Lord Howe Island? So I went back to each of my three sites, or I was already there, and um, we did surveys at lagoon and crest sites to determine percent cover uh, at each site um, to the species level. We ran the data in a non-metric multidimensional multi scaling, an NMDS, and there's a clear distinction. Um, Lizard Island in red, lagoon and crest, are shown in squares and triangles, one tree island in black, and Lord Howe Island in blue. And the distance between points represents the difference in assemblage structure. So Lizard Island and One Tree Island are separated by about 1,200 kilometers, but the assemblage structure is quite similar. Uh, Lord Howe Island is about 1,000 kilometers south of One Tree Island, and we do see a distinction in assemblage structure. And uh, an analysis of similarity confirmed that these groups are uh, significantly different. And simper analysis um, produce these lists of characteristic species that account for the differences in assemblage structure. And the NMDS also produced um, species scores. So it's clear that so each dot represents a species that we observed in, um, in our surveys. And it's clear that a higher x-axis score is associated with Lord Howe Island. And so I use these axis scores, these species-specific axis scores, and try to determine whether life history traits associated with those species can predict that distinction. And so I used a species traits database compiled by Andrew and Josh um, with new data as well as data from other sources. And for traits related to biology, um, we had data on mode of larval development, so brood or broadcast sexuality, whether it's single sex, gonochore, or a hermaphrodite. <coughs> also the nutritional mode of, of the larvae, whether it's autotrophic, meaning it has symbionts, or it's lecithotrophic, which means it's non-feeding. Also, um, a trait we were uh, considering using was the rate of larval development, where brooders were given a number of zero because they're immediately competent to settle, whereas spawners um, that variation uh, depends generally on the egg size, so there was a scale of zero to six. Um, for morphology, we looked at coralite size, uh, modularity, so whether it was colonial or solitary. And for traits related to environment, we had depth data, so depth range and maximum depth. And <clears throat> it's been suggested that um, depth range is a good indicator of environmental tolerance, so whether it's a generalist or a specialist. And wave exposure, so whether the uh, species is generally found in exposed regions, protected regions, or both. So I put these traits into a multiple linear regression model where the dependent variable was that x-axis score, which was a very simple way to explain the distinction between the Great Barrier Reef and Lord Howe Island and the predictors were these species traits. And I ran the diagnostics for um, the regression and confirmed normality and homogeneity of the residuals. Um, I checked each trait to see how it related to the, um, <clears throat> the axis score, whether it was linear, quadratic, or cubic. I also incorporated a mixed model. So I looked at the random effects of clade and suborder, and this accounts for non-independence of evolutionary history because closely related species are likely to have the same traits. So this accounts for that non-independence. I also checked um, interactions and collinearity. So if the traits influenced each other in any way, I um, tested for that. And because of issues of um, interactions and collinearity, I had to take some traits out of the model um, <clears throat> to fit the assumptions of regression. And so when two traits um, had issues of interacting with each other, I removed the one that had um, that didn't fit the model as well using a Kaike information criterion 
AICC. So it left us with six traits that went into the model in the end. So I generated multiple models and I identified the best ones using AIC and then averaged the best models that were considered equivalent based, based on very small differences in the AIC values. And interestingly, the only predictor that was consistently selected by the best models was mode of larval development. Um, none of the other traits in the model had a clear relationship with the AXIS score. And as we would expect, um, brooders are mo more associated with Lord Howe Island and so more capable, capable of crossing this dispersal barrier and becoming abundant. And here's, uh, this shows the partial coefficients and the 95% confidence interval shown in gray don't overlap, so uh, we can consider it to be a strong effect. On the y-axis, we have the axis score from the Great Barrier Reef to Lord Howe Island. So again, the brooders are associated with Lord Howe Island. And each point represents a different species. So it's important to notice that um, this effect is driven by high abundance of about eight species um, at Lord Howe Island, or including at Lord Howe Island. So mode of larval development was the best predictor for changes in abundance between the Great Barrier Reef and Lord Howe Island. And this suggests that brooding coral species are likely to be more abundant in marginal conditions. Um, this is likely to be because they're better colonizers, um, which we would expect because they're competent to settle on release. And I'm still, we're still interpreting these results. Um, so there's a bit to think about, but the um, mode of larval development may be able to predict the ability of all marine species to cross, to cross barriers and become abundant. So the broad overall conclusions of my thesis are that raised temperatures, reduced survival, and altered development in early life stages of coral. And in the absence of adaptation, the lower latitude populations are likely to be at a greater risk of to temperature rise. And I mean this and the effects of warming relies on the breadth of tolerance of an organism in addition to the amplitude of environmental change, which is important to consider. And mode of larval development may predict abundance across barriers. So the implications are that Rising temperatures are affecting marine vertebrates across life stages. Um, it's important not to just focus on adults. Um, early life stages are very important and they're understudied. Um, the impacts of climate change will vary by location as well as species. And as I said, um, it's important to consider early life strategies. And I mean, climate change will have profound effects on patterns of dispersal and population dynamics. Um, and that's clear from my results. But we do need to, to find out more about these early life stages and what's happening across large scales. So during the course of my PhD, I presented my work at three conferences. And here's my list of publications since beginning my PhD in 2010. Uh, the first two are in preparation and the first four are um, from my thesis data. Are there any questions? absence of adaptation, yes. which could be a problem. Your data is showing that you do have a proportion of survival at those high temperatures, and you, of that you do have a proportion of normal development. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, and given that you know, corals have evolved and adapted for many years, um, do you think there is really going to be a major impact or a major problem for these species given climate change? Well, I think the main um, thing to note is that the changes will vary by location. 
So, for instance, in the northern Great Barrier Reef, temperatures aren't rising as quickly in the southern Great Barrier Reef, and it changes throughout latitude. But yes, that point of adaptation is an important one. Um, and I guess I think that the, um, the rate of change is quite rapid compared to um, local adaptation, as you saw from the graphs. The um, even current ranges exist exceeded the thermal tolerances that I um, identified in the study. Yeah, although something that I would like to do in the future is, is look at, um, compare, or I can comment on the adaptation if I do um, transplant studies. Um, and of course, this doesn't take that into account, so there are those limitations. John? John, sorry. Yeah, hi. Uh, nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering in the in the last uh, your last chapter, where you had that overwhelming uh, effect of the uh, mode of larval development. I was wondering if you might try to take out that particular variable and rerun your analyses and try to figure out you know what some of the other underlying factors might be contributing. Yes, that's a great point. Um, something that I will be doing next is removing the mode of development uh, and seeing if the rate of development, for instance, um, ha influences, which I suspect, I suspect it does. And the reason I took out rate of development was because it had um, collinearity issues with mode. So yes, I will be um, looking at that. And it's also important to consider that um, Though the role of life history traits might be driving this difference in assemblage, it's important to consider uh, large-scale patterns of temperature as well as hydrodynamics. So, yeah. Lot to Good. And on that on that latter point, I, I noticed in the first part of your talk, with your experimental data, you sort of um, sort of suggested that there wasn't so much of a thermal barrier between the north and the south, um, but then as a as a sort of almost justification for your latter studies, you you stated that there was a barrier. So <laughs> I'm wondering how where do you really sit on that? I think the the first part is is saying that the barrier isn't filtering out. It isn't applying to dispersal capabilities. I think it's um, I think possibly at Lord Howe Island, the um, the effect we're seeing there with mode of development is just that brooders are more competent to settle or more able to settle and self-recruit locally. So I think as far as long distance dispersal events goes, it's possible that uh, cold, um, cold temperatures aren't acting as a dispersal barrier. So why is it that um, long distance dispersal events occur, but then don't the species don't become abundant. So when I was doing my surveys at Lord Howe Island, we did notice that there were a lot of rare species that didn't appear to be breeding, um, or just we would only notice one colony or one or two colonies. And so the question is about long distance dispersal, but also once they arrive, what makes them more successful? Okay, thanks. Um, just in terms of your sort of thermal reaction or thermal performance curves, I was just interested that your um, larval effects were sort of being seen quite strongly at current day temperatures, which really sort of, or temperatures they normally would experience mm. in the summer, um, which really suggests that perhaps those fitness performance curves like was presented in Tewkesbury isn't actually being controlled by larval development and that there's another trait that these populations or species have that actually controls their distribution in their um, affect the optimal temperature. Mm. And I guess I was just wondering if you had an idea of what trait that might be, since it doesn't seem to be... It doesn't seem to be the related lab. to... Because you're already activity. seeing um, negative effects even within the temperatures that they normally experience. So at your one tree island, you started at 20 degrees <coughs> ambient, but one tree gets a lot warmer than that in summer, so we're, mm. we currently must be seeing larvae that are experiencing that temperature. One tree doesn't get much warmer than that during the summer. Um, 24 is about the normal summer temperature. You, but you would have 
fluctuation throughout the day, of course. Yeah, sure, but in the lagoon, it must get warmer than 24. That's mm. I, cool. A lot of my projections, or the projection data and current data, was taken from larger scale averages from LOF, but I also looked at the um, on-reef temperature data collected by the Bruce sensors. And indeed, they are, experien they are experiencing temperatures outside of what I identified in my experiments as a threshold. Yeah. And so the relationship between the current range and the threshold did vary between locations. I think that was the main finding. Yeah, I just was wondering if you thought there were any other traits that would actually be determining that thermal performance curve, because it won't look just be uh, those larval effects, because otherwise you would expect that there'd be much stronger effects than what you're seeing, say, normally. What do you... I guess just because at once you're seeing such strong effects over 24 degrees, right? You saw mm -hmm. that dropping off quite quickly. But you overlaid that current range. Mm -hmm. And so if you drew a thermal performance curve, you'd say that in some cases they're already experienced temperatures mm -hmm. above the optimum for this trait. Mm -hmm. But the population still persists quite rapidly. So I'm wondering if you think there's other traits, like perhaps um, development time, so when the egg's actually developing in the coral. Temperature during that period is more important for wide populations. Yes. In fact, I should point out that the ambient temperature I used was the um, more related to temperatures during gametogenesis. So for the maternal effects of the temperatures experienced by adult corals um, while they're producing the egg and sperm is likely to influence the thermal tolerance of the gametes and therefore the larvae. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah. That's good. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. That's thank you.